we all remember what happened there. The flat screen TVs came out, they were unquestionably better, and they were the same price. The next thing you knew, you couldn't sell a CRT TV for a dollar. And the only place you saw was at the end of somebody's driveway getting rained on. And I kind of think by 2030, almost all new car sales are going to be electric. I think you will see beautiful design. I think that you will see great experiences. I think that as a society, we are moving towards more smart technology in general. Hey, Earthlings, welcome to the latest episode of the Earthlings podcast. We offer you greetings and salutations. Today, we are going to talk about why your next car will be an EV. Because on this show, we like to cover what technology or other aspects of society are coming into your world and what information we have today to make the best decisions for our collective future. My name is Lisa Ann Pinkerton, and I am a former NPR environmental science reporter, also did some work with PBS. And today I run public relations and communications for companies that are involved in the energy transition with Technica Communications. And I support women and all kinds of people in the space with women in clean tech and sustainability. And my co-host is Christian Rosland. Hello, I'm Christian Rosland. I'm a writer, consultant, and energy wonk. I used to run the PV Magazine USA site, among other gigs. Today, we're not just going to talk about why your next car will be an EV, but we're going to talk about what that's going to be like for you as a driver or passenger. And we're going to speak to one of the millions of EV drivers who's already out there on the road to give you some real-world context about what this change means. Mm-hmm. And Christian, I'm really excited we got a chance to talk to John Weaver. He's our man on the street, if you will, for this show. And because the EV experience is is really that. It is an experiential, tactile opportunity for people. And it's once once you sort of get that firsthand experience, either driving in an EV yourself or riding in one, having a friend who owns one, suddenly this whole concept of transferring from the internal combustion engine to an electric vehicle opens up your world. And suddenly you're like, oh, that's not such a big deal. And oh my gosh, look how great this could be. Yeah. And the car makers are picking up on this, right? Uh, When I was doing my research, uh, I came across this great quote from Volvo's CEO, Hawken Samuelson, and in the Financial Times. And he said, quote, the customer is always right, but I'm totally convinced that by the end of the decade, there will be no customers who really want to stay with a petrol engine. And I think it's no surprise that Volvo is one of the first car makers to commit to a global end of ICE vehicles. And this is by 2030. Yeah, you know, I agree with Hawken. I mean, do you really want your smelly, noisy old car that only 22% of the power you put in the tank gets the wheels? <laughs> like <laughs> EVs are car 2.0. Mm-hmm. I mean, and this, this manifests in performance too. Mm-hmm. Faster torque, silence, you know, I, I remember having old Ford pickups that shook and, you know, none of that stuff with EVs. Mm-hmm. They're oh. smooth. And the acceleration is just insane. Oh, yeah. I mean, oh, they're really com- computers on wheels. If you think about the over the air updates that you get, you get in your car the next day and you get a little alert that's like, hey, you have this new feature now. The cars themselves don't feel as outdated, right? Yeah. I had a car which there was a little port for me to put my phone in. And as soon as I changed my phone to a new phone, it didn't fit anymore. And <laughs> then the, the, the whole system wasn't updating. The maps wouldn't update because I didn't. So I didn't use that anymore. And when I talked to the dealer, they said, oh, yeah, your car's a 2012. Well, the last update they did for this car was in 2012. You have to buy a new car if you want an updated infotainment system. And I'm like, really? Really? Yeah, not that way with EVs. No. Nope. They automatically update. Mm-hmm. And speaking of automatic updates, you are going to be automatically updated out <laughs> of a new internal combustion engine or ICE car mm-hmm. if you live in any one of a number of countries in Europe or in California, because there's going to be a phase out date after which no more new internal combustion engine cars can be sold. Mm-hmm. And, you know, that's, what, that's one of the interesting aspects of this story to me. It gets to this, I don't want to call it a conundrum, but so... On one hand, we have these mandatory policies to say, okay, no more EVs past this date. On the other hand, EVs are starting to replace internal combustion engines because they're better, and it's it's a technology disruption. Mm -hmm. It's like the other technology disruptions that we've seen in the past with cell phones replacing landlines or 
cars themselves replacing horses and carriages. Mm -hmm. It's just that these mandatory policies are speeding it up. Yes. Which we have to do. Yeah, quickening the process, if you will. Yep. And, and I think it's interesting to think about, you know, we've come full circle, if you will, in terms of EVs, because some of the first automobiles to be built in the late 1800s, early 1900s were electric. In fact, <laughs> did you know this? Have you heard about this one? Yeah, um, this is a new one for me. And there were quite a few of them. And women really liked them, actually, because they weren't as smelly. You didn't have to crank them to get started. <laughs> and that which took a lot of muscle. Go out and crank your engine. Seriously. Yeah. And, and so before the automatic starter was invented, it was pretty much a toss up between ICE vehicles and electric. And, and even Thomas Edison and Henry Ford collaborated on an electric vehicle. And Henry Ford was actually very excited about offering an electric vehicle, but the battery technology just wasn't there. And ultimately he said, I'm yeah. sorry, Thomas Edison, battery technology is not here. I'm going with gasoline. And then everybody knows the history after that. Yep. Well, I mean, that's what's interesting is it, it is interesting how it's come full circle. And now the technology is there now, you know, even compared to 10 years ago, lithium ion batteries, they can do a lot. You know, I drive a Chevy Volt. And when I combine the range from the battery and the gasoline engine, because it has both, it's the same as the, the range for the Chevy Bolt. Like, you know, the range is, forget about range anxiety if you're doing one of these new ones. You know, they've, they've really progressed. But at the same time, there's other challenges that aren't necessarily these sort of hard technology challenges. Yeah, yeah. And if we think about the, from now until 2025, there are going to be 43 new models of EVs. Now, granted, you know, some of these are not going to make it to market. But the high-end supercars, we'll see a couple of those. Uh, some of those sedans, uh, some of the coupes, we will see a few of those and the pickup trucks. You got Rivian, Lordstown Motors and the uh, Ford F-150 Lightning. These are all going to completely transform uh, the market uh, in a good way, I think. So as long as we can figure out the charging issues. Oh, the charging issues. Yes. I mean, and these are problems that we had, you know, when the automobile was first invented, there wasn't a gas station on every corner, <laughs> right? So we overcame this problem once, we can do it again. And that's why I'm really excited for uh, that voice that you heard at the top of the show. I'm excited for you all to hear her interview. Her name is Camille Terry. She's a good friend of mine. And she's also the founder and CEO of Charger Help. And she's also a board member who leads the LA chapter for Women in Clean Tech and Sustainability. So the other voice that you heard at the top of the hour is Charles Morris. He's the senior editor at Charge Electric Vehicles magazine. He's also the author of the book Tesla, How Elon Musk and His Company Made EVs Cool. He's been following the space literally for decades, and he was able to give us some big picture context and tell us what to expect. So let's hear from Charles. Charles, why don't you give us a quick, oh, for our, our listeners who don't really know the difference here between some of the acronyms. Why don't you give us a quick overview of the various options with vehicle electrification? You know, plug-in okay. hybrids, hybrids, full electric. Yeah, yeah. Well, there's several different varieties. And, you know, in the in the popular press tends to use the term electric vehicle for any vehicle that has an electric motor. But in within the auto industry, uh we tend to reserve the term electric vehicle for a, a pure electric vehicle, one that has no gas engine, just an electric vehicle. And then you have uh, hybrids and plug-in hybrids, which we include all of those under the term electrified vehicles. So just to uh, a quick summary, a hybrid like the Toyota Prius has a gas engine and it has an electric motor. And the battery is charged as you drive by the gas engine. A plug-in hybrid adds the ability to plug in. So you can not only, it, it charges while driving like a regular hybrid, but you also have the option to plug it in and charge the battery so that you gain a certain amount of uh, time driving on, a certain number of miles driving on pure electric power. And then what 
we call an electric vehicle also described as a, you could call it a pure EV or uh, some people say a BEV, a battery electric vehicle. That has only an electric motor. There's no gas engine. Uh, it is powered strictly by the battery power, and you you have to plug it in to charge it up. And there's yet another uh, possibility, which is technically an electric vehicle, and that's a hydrogen fuel cell vehicle. And uh, that is powered by hydrogen, but it is technically also an electric vehicle because the hydrogen powers uh, an electric motor. So, um, and I guess what we're mainly going to be talking about here today is uh, electric vehicles, uh, the pure electric vehicle or or battery electric vehicle. Sure. Well, maybe we should take a second and chat about that because uh, it's, you know, I certainly plug in hybrids are a part of the market today. I have a Volt sitting in my driveway, Uh, but it seems like, you know, when I look at the reports by BNEF and other sources, there's sort of the prediction that battery electric vehicles are going to come to dominate this space. Do you agree with that assessment, or do you think that there'll be space for these other types in the future as well? Well, the plug-in hybrid is a transitional technology. So, you know, eventually the market's going to move to strictly uh, pure EVs. At the moment, and this will probably continue for, for quite a few years to come, uh, there are some people who would probably be better suited with a, um, to have a, a plug-in hybrid. Uh, for example, people that often take a lot of long road trips, uh, because of course the, the plug-in hybrid in a sense gives you the best of both worlds. You can plug it in and use no gas at all, uh, or you can drive it without plugging in if you need that longer range. I have one myself. I've got a, pri- a Prius uh, plug-in. Well, uh, now, Charles, the, the title of our show is Your Next Car Will Be an EV. Right. So how truthful do you think that statement is? Well, it's definitely true in my case. I'll never buy uh, a gas car again. I've got a, uh, a, a Prius plug-in and a, and a Nissan Leaf, and uh, I'm all done with gas cars. For uh, other folks, um, I think that really depends very much on what part of the world they live in and on what they're, what kind of a, of a car buyer they are. Um, in Europe, uh, or a lot of countries in Europe, they're seeing a very high level of, of EV adoption. And I think any car buyer in Europe right now is definitely uh, considering an EV. Uh, in the U.S., not so much so because we're a little behind them, uh, especially in terms of the, the types of vehicles that are available. So here it kind of depends on what your uh, buying habits are. If you're someone who buys a higher price performance oriented uh, car, then you certainly uh, have heard of Tesla and going to be considering that. Um, if you're a Lower priced car buyer, uh, your options are a little more limited. So I'd love to get to that in a moment. These, you know, the different models and options and particularly subsegments. But, but just for now, um, to give more of an overview, what are the fundamental factors that you see driving EV adoption? How much of this growth is the globally? How much of this do you think is the internal combustion engine bans in Europe? I know a lot of nations have 2030. Bands, some, you know, Norway 2025. Uh, and how much is just batteries getting cheaper and the options getting better? Well, uh, I'd like to reframe that question a little bit, if I, if I may. The, um, I think the ICE bands, which have been announced in several countries around the world and, uh, one, at least one U.S. state so far. And, uh, certainly the, the, uh, Always the, the cost of batteries is coming down, and that's really changing the equation. Uh, those things are driving automakers to invest more in electrification and to get more serious about producing uh, EVs. But I, I don't think those factors are really driving consumers to buy EVs yet because it's going to take an, a couple uh, more years before the automakers really have uh, – uh, a lot of different kinds of models on the market, a lot of good options. Um, 
And again, as, as far as what's driving actual EV adoption, that gets back to where people live. Because, for example, in Norway, which is the world's EV capital, I think uh, over half of the new car sales there are now EVs. The way they kind of got that ball rolling was with uh, emissions-based taxes on new cars. In Norway, if you want to buy a gas-guzzling car, you pay a huge amount of tax. You buy an EV, you pay little or no tax. Um, now, for various political reasons, that's not going to happen here in the U.S. Uh, we have a uh, federal tax credit, which is a not a very efficient way to do things. That's not really something that, that benefits everyone. Uh, but certainly, you know, the Biden administration has announced they really want to encourage EVs. A uh, number of state governments are encouraging EVs. So I think we're going to see more and more uh, incentives to uh, to buy EVs. Also, uh, electric utilities are very keen on EVs and Depending on where you live, you may be eligible for uh, some sort of goodies from your electric utilities. So uh, to answer your question, up until now, uh, those kind of government incentives have been a big uh, driver of, of EV adoption. But I think uh, I think the economic factors will become much more important over the next couple of years uh, as some more models come on the market. Uh, and it's already, for some drivers, it's already cheaper to drive electric on it. When you think about the total cost of ownership, buying the vehicle may cost more, but the amount of money that you're going to save for a lot of drivers is it's already a better deal. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, sometimes you can, you know, if you, you factor in all the gas that you would buy over the lifetime of a vehicle, you're almost purchasing the vehicle a second time. I know on the commercial side of things, you'll spend twice as much on fuel than the purchase price of the vehicle. So you end up buying the car, the vehicle three times. Maintenance costs too. Yeah. The uh, EVs have a lot lower maintenance cost. And yes, uh, the, we're seeing a, a tremendous amount of activity on the commercial side uh, for buses and for what they call last mile delivery vehicles. You know, the kind of vans that bring your Amazon stuff and UPS and all that. The economic case is already uh, there. It really it has been for a, a while now. Uh, what's kind of been holding that back is that the the fleet owners all wanted to do long pilots and test these things in real world conditions, and now they've kind of done that, and we're starting to see that some of the big fleet owners are are placing substantial orders. So, mm-hmm. uh, yeah, there's a lot of action on the commercial EV side at the moment. Yeah. Well, we wanted to talk about, we're really interested in the consumer side of things too. And when I was doing some research for this, uh, this episode, there, I counted 43 different electric vehicles expected to be released in the next five years. I mean, there's Japan's As Park Owl, which kind of looks like a Lotus uh, body with big gullwing doors. And then, you know, you've got Volvo, Volkswagen and BMW and like all these brands, right? Even some canoe and the new entrants, right? So what's, can you help us have a reality check here? What, what do you think is the best potential for these brands, and these types of cars actually making it into consumers' hands? Well, that's, uh, that can be pretty complicated to sort out. Um, as you mentioned, there's a number of startup companies that are putting out EVs. Some of them look really cool. Some of them look really weird. Uh, <laughs> and most of those are probably going to be pretty low volume uh, vehicles, at least for, for now. There's also a wave of Chinese automakers that are, uh, you know, these Chinese automakers have wanted to sell cars in America and Europe for a long time, and they're getting pretty close to being able to do that. Uh, some of them, uh, I think Xpeng is already selling some uh, EVs in Europe, and some of those companies may be hitting the U.S. market before long. And of course, every major automaker is, has EVs either on sale or in the pipeline. So, uh, there's just a huge number of, of new models coming out. Um, 
unfortunately, you know, only a subset of those models are going to be, you know, fairly mass market vehicles that are available everywhere. Um, some of the some of the vehicles from the, the startups are very expensive. Most of them are starting out at the kind of the high level, just as Tesla did. They start out selling a, an expensive luxury vehicle, and over the years they work their way down to the more of the mid market. And uh, as far as the cars from the major automakers, uh, some of those are what we call compliance cars. That means that the automaker is building some EV models, but they're just going to produce just enough to satisfy the government regulators, and they're not really interested in selling a lot of them. Uh, and until recently, that's pretty much been the case. Uh, now, you know, things are, are changing pretty fast, and over the next couple of years, some of these automakers, certainly VW and perhaps GM, are getting really serious and hopefully going to be selling some EVs in, in, you know, real mass market quantities. But it's just hard to say because they, they blow hot and cold. You know, they, uh, one year they say, oh, we're going all in on EVs. The next year they pull back and they just go up and down. So it's a, it's kind of a wild card. What are these automakers going to do? Uh, as I said, I, I know VW is serious about it, and I think GM is going to be too. But as far as the others, it's it's really tough. Um, as far as what's out there right now, I really like uh, the Chevy Bolt. If you're um, not in the the price range to buy a Tesla, then I would I would say the Chevy Bolt's probably the best thing uh, going right now. And they've got a new version of that coming out next year. But there there are definitely some good options out there and over the, just the next year or two there's going to be a lot more you know christian i would not be surprised if there are people out there knowing that they need a new car wanting a new car but waiting to make their purchase because they don't want to make a purchase too early and make the wrong choice Yep. I'm sure there's people out there waiting for the electric pickup versions of, mm -hmm. especially that electric F-150. I mean, people are lining up to buy that vehicle. It's such an iconic vehicle. The F-150, the F-Series is the most, it's the best-selling vehicle mm -hmm. of all time in America. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I think that the F-150, that's a vehicle that's really going to raise awareness of electric vehicles. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I think it'd be a massive sea change. Uh, once it becomes available, because especially for the average person, you're just not going to be able to drive around without seeing them, assuming people are buying them, right? Because, but there is a lot of brand loyalty out there. And I wouldn't be surprised if there's pickup truck owners out there who have, you know, bought into the fossil fuel culture, like we're talking, like you've seen, like rolling coal or icing EV charging stations by, by parking your big pickup truck in the, in the spot. So somebody can't charge things like this. But as soon as somebody they know purchases a F-150 lightning electric truck, they're going to have that firsthand experience. And it's going to be really hard to deny those advantages of faster torque, better acceleration, lower maintenance costs, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, you know, I think that's the thing is even with the limited models of EVs that are available now, people are already ex discovering this vastly superior experience of driving an EV. So, yeah, yeah when it comes to more of the cars that they've known, it's that's just going to make it easier. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, I think it's no surprise that Tesla is uh, manufacturing its Cybertruck in Texas. And, you know, there's people who would resist the Cybertruck just on certain merits because it's manufactured in California and you got to <laughs> own the libs by not uh -huh. buying it. But if it's built in Texas by Texans, it makes, makes the argument much harder. Yeah, definitely. So speaking of, you know, real people <laughs> and, yeah. and their real lived experiences, uh, for the next part of the show, we spoke to an EV owner. John Fitzgerald Weaver is a solar developer who's known online as Commercial Solar Guy. He's a former coworker of mine at PV Magazine, where he still writes, and he is the proud owner of a Tesla Model Y.
when you finally got the Tesla and you started driving it, what was one of the first things you noticed about the driving experience that someone who's never been in an electric car should know? Be very conscious of how quickly they accelerate. <laughs> number one, or, is it instant? And number two, it doesn't stop. It doesn't stop <laughs> until the car stops. It's like, and it just, oh, you got to be careful. Uh <laughs> It's quiet. You know, you sit in this vehicle and you get lost in it. I was driving south on 80, 88, I guess. I, I can't remember the road right now in, uh, in Westport. And it's just, just straight drive. We were in fall, crisp blue sky. The viewing experience in this particular car, this is the Model Y from Tesla. It's, uh, it's just got a whole bunch of glass. Like, so you just have a large wide viewing and I'm driving down this road. The car is driving itself because I have the uh, autopilot. And so music is playing. I'm seeing fall trees fully surrounding me going past. And like I literally like had an emotional moment because for me, this also represented the fact I grew up on welfare. So being able to buy a real car, a new car is something representative as a, a, a moment in life. So there was just like multiple layers of black. Like, wow, I am in a spaceship. I can't, it's floating down the road. The car is driving itself. I plugged in at a high noon just so I could feel warm and fuzzy about myself in Massachusetts because I know how much electricity we produce via solar. And like all these variables were coming together. And it's like, for me, this is like, you know, we're evolving. And, and that quietness, like you're in a, in a quiet little envelope. And I know this is what driving a nice car, like a, you know, a big Porsche, a big, uh, one of those big, uh, BMWs that when you close the doors, they have like, they seal you in a little bit. And those are really quiet inside, almost dangerously quiet. And, uh, so it's quiet and the car is fast. Those are the two things. What about hmm. the regenerative braking? Cause when we got our electric car, mm-hmm. it, it was, there was, there was a lot of it. Yeah. <laughs> the driving, it's like, I'm in the passenger seat, like being yes. thrown forward. Yes. Yeah. Uh, um, it took a day and I don't use the brake pedal anymore. You, the regenerative braking is your brake 80% of the time. Um, when you're around town and somebody cuts you off, you got to hit the brake. And I drive in New Bedford. So there's a lot of, uh, aggressive side street drivers that you have to watch. So I find myself touching the brake for them, but otherwise, very quickly, you stop using the brake because it's not necessary. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It took a day. It took my first full day of driving on the highway to get used to it and be like, oh, that's what that is. Now, for people who, who don't drive, what is this regenerative or don't drive EVs? What is this regenerative braking? Can you explain that? Yeah, so so your car is oh, – so there's this guy from England. He was a weird guy. His name is Newton. Did these equations, and one of them so talked about momentum. And so if something's moving, it has force. And if you want to stop it, you would generate heat, you would generate energy, all kinds of things happen. Well, if you use your brake pads, usually they're going to get hot. But there are ways to absorb that energy that hits there. And so – the slowing of the car, the, the, the mechanical features, the mechanical hardware that slows the car has the ability to absorb that energy and put it back into the battery. Now, this is not the energy that keeps the car running for 90%. This is a small piece of that. So it's like, it's not like, you know, you could drive for 10 miles and then reabsorb 10 miles of driving. No, you absorb the instantaneous energy you have and the car can get like 75% of the newtons, the force that you have, the speed plus velocity, it can absorb those two and turn it into KWHs. So that when you're driving from the mountains of Western North Carolina to the campgrounds of South Carolina, you have to come down a few thousand feet and for an extended period of time, your car will charge. <laughs> Yeah. So basically yeah. for the experience of this, what this means is you're slowing down more when you take your foot off the, the gas, off the accelerator than you, yes. than you would in an, in an internal combustion engine vehicle. 
Right. So yeah, that's yeah. got to be really off putting the first time that that happens. You take your, your foot mm. off the accelerator. Oh, you slowed yeah. way down. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Cause your body actually, you Everybody may not notice this, but in general, your body instantaneously knows that you're pressing the gas. Mm -hmm. The times that you in your life might not notice this is when you've accidentally bumped your car into neutral and you hit the gas pedal because you don't realize this, but Naturally, you are pushing your body forward when you're not flat back in your seat. You're actually pushing your body in anticipation of that acceleration. And you don't realize this because you're just so used to it because you're a driving creature. You have evolved to drive and uh, well, not evolved to drive, but adapted to the nature of driving. And so uh, so when you brake, you have that same thing until you learn that, oh, this is what happens when my foot lifts from the gas versus being pressed on the gas. Cause you're still doing the body movement thing. When you press the gas, you're balancing out your momentum because you naturally understand that Newton guy. But, uh, so it just, it's, it is. And you go, and you're like, Arr. and you do it two or three times. And, and there's also another negative of this feature. You're a driver who has been taught for decades, if you're a 42-year-old male, to stop in a risky moment by slamming the brake pedal, slamming the thing that stops your car. You're like, <gasps> hit that brake, boom. But in a world where you've stopped pressing the brake pedal, what do you do in a complex moment? You slam your foot. There have been multiple instances where Teslas have been said to accelerated unexplainably as I was sitting in the front seat in a parking lot and I put the car into a building. <laughs> and it seems to turn out that we <laughs> creatures have been trained to slam that brake, but every once in a while we, ah, and we hit the gas. <laughs> and remember that earlier thing I mentioned about the acceleration of a 4,500 pound <laughs> box of metal? <laughs> It's good at it. Yeah. <laughs> Especially when you slam it. Oh, oh. Okay, so tell us about another experience. Tell us about autopilot. What's it like driving with with autopilot? What's your what's your experience here? Oh. <laughs> that angel sound that. Oh. <laughs> Autopilot's sweet, dude. It's not level five. You know, level five is uh, pure robotics. So within the AI driving world, there's level one through level five. Level one is cruise control or something. I don't know it exactly. Level like two. Adaptive, adaptive cruise control. Like maybe. One. Yeah, yeah. Maybe. I, I don't. Yeah. Uh, all The only ones I know right now uh, to a degree are two and five because five is like it's a robot. You, there's nothing going on. And two is what Tesla hopes to fully have with FSD when it fully launches. And uh, so I just hear the people talk about it, uh, but there's like two, three, four, five, and they all have these really cool characteristics. But what I have is level two, which is full self-driving, but it's not fully launched because I don't have the beta, which is cooler than what I have. It does its job wonderfully. It's calmer than me. It stays focused always. It doesn't try to pass people. It doesn't get aggressive. It slows down. I set it at six car lengths between the last car if I get, it'll tell me to change lanes. You can, it will actually change lanes if you let it. I don't let it. I, I still keep the human control over it. And, um, it's, it, it is a tool that is worth more than worth the $8,000 I paid for it. No questions asked. Hmm. What about charging? Especially on, you say you like to do these road trips. So. Um, has that been more of an arduous experience than you might have initially thought, or has it been pretty easy? So uh, since I have a Tesla, I have access to the supercharger network. The supercharger network has superchargers freaking everywhere, especially in the Northeast Corridor. Oh, my goodness. There's a charger every other highway stop. The car is optimized to run from about 20% in the battery to 80%. They want you to charge for about 20 minutes every 200-ish miles. You can be in there fast. You can't even go to the bathroom, buy a coffee, wash your hands, stretch, you know, 20 minutes every two hours. Perfect. On the highways, it's absolutely amazing. Uh, and I think that's really the case across the most of the United States. Uh, it's even in southern Canada where the Tesla network is fully built out. So there is no... Uh, what's the word? Range anxiety. Is that the word that we always had? 
Mm-hmm. There's no range anxiety on yeah. the on the interstate system in the United States if you own a Tesla. If That's, you own a Tesla. Uh, yeah. Mm-hmm. Local charging, however, oh, not terrible, actually. In fact, oh, should I say this in public? Well, you can't charge from your house, right? I don't have a charger in my home. Right. So I don't. <laughs> I there's a place I, in New Bedford that we've moved. Know. <laughs> okay. We know, we know one of them. Location. An undisclo- <laughs> undisclosed location. Yeah. Where charging is free. Well, Christian, I don't think John's alone when it comes to having problems charging his EV. I know a lot of people have this challenge, myself included. When we had a Tesla Model S, one of the, I think it was a 2013, and we lived in an apartment complex, and we couldn't get the apartment complex to install a charger for about four months. So we were parking at the uh, Cupertino City Hall, where there was a free charging station, and we would charge it up, and then we would drive it home. <laughs> That's, and this is what's funny is you had these challenges, even though Tesla has built a nationwide fast charger network. Mm-hmm. If you don't have a Tesla, you're dealing with patchwork of different charging networks, each with their own payment system. As I mentioned before, I drive a Chevy Volt, which is a plug-in hybrid. Not only have I found that there are not a lot of public chargers, but when I do find one, a lot of times it doesn't work. I know. And it is the bane of one's existence if you are an EV driver. I mean, you already have range anxiety and you're already, if if it's a long trip, you're planning out uh, where your charging is going to happen. And then you're crossing your fingers that the charging port, once you get there, will actually be operational. And the apps that you use could tell you that it's operational. Somebody used it yesterday, et cetera, et cetera. But still, it's this risk that you're you're taking every time you go out there. I'm not surprised that people have anxiety around this. Yeah, it's funny because, you know, I think we've dealt with a lot of the range anxiety by, as I mentioned earlier, just increasing building better lithium ion batteries. Mm -hmm. The range Mm -hmm. has gotten so much better. But still, if you're planning to go somewhere and charge and that charger doesn't work... I, yeah, you've got some numbers on this, don't you? You did some research. Yes. Um, Beyond the angry tweets that you can see from time to time. (laughs) Oh, who among ye has not rage tweeted? (laughs) Let him cast the first tweet or stone, whatever. Um, Um, The stat was 50% of EV drivers surveyed last year reported having problems charging and with those uh, who were not Tesla drivers, those problems were worse. So you, if you were not a Tesla driver, you had a higher likelihood of having problems charging. Now imagine if, if 50% of the people driving gasoline engines had a problem finding a gas station. Oh, my God. Yeah. There I would mean, be that's riots in the street. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's just like, that's a non-starter. <sighs> And forget it if you're a renter. I mean, we were renting and we were lucky enough to be able to get the, the, the apartment complex to install a charging station, but they couldn't figure out how to bill us for the energy. So they're like, you know what? We'll just, we're just going to charge you a little bit more a month to rent your parking spot because we just can't figure out how to charge you for the energy you're using. Yep. And we counted ourselves really lucky. Yeah. And I mean, that's the thing. Like your apartment building, renters are more likely to live in multifamily housing, which is another barrier. Mm -hmm. Uh, You know, a lot of landlords don't see it as a priority to install EV chargers for tenants, especially if the landlord is paying the power bill. And if you try to work with your utility, now granted, utilities are getting better at this, but a couple of years ago, the utility would tell you, oh, you want five charging stations in this building? Well, then you need to upgrade your energy services, the electricity Hmm. services in the building so that all five of those stations can charge at the top rate all at the same time. Now, you don't actually need that, right? You can use software to aggregate the charging (laughs) because if you're parking it, likely you don't really need it again until the morning. So you've got, what, eight, 10 hours to charge 20% of the battery, right? It doesn't all have to happen at once. Yeah, but there's this larger point, which is that I think we're going undergoing this shift to public fast charging. Mm Mm-hmm. And, and there's certain applications where this is totally necessary. If you drive an Uber or a Lyft 
or for long haul trucks, mm -hmm. it's not optional. You know, there's no charge overnight. Like you need to be able to charge and you need to be able to charge quickly. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And in California, by 2030, 90% of the vehicles that are in ride hailing fleets are going to be required to be electric. So cities get a chance to figure this out. And I think you're right. Public charging, public fast charging, and perhaps charging depots where the city has concentrated its electric power with a big substation for that area. And the buses go there to charge. The, the UPS and, and FedEx delivery vehicles of the world go to charge. Your, your people doing last mile delivery on their e-bikes go there and charge. Cus consumers charge. Everybody charges in the same place. I think that is going to be the future for, for some of these big cities like San Francisco. Yeah, it's interesting. You know, that future has already come in Shenzhen, China. Oh. If you go to Shenzhen, China, there are these massive charging stations. Oh, yeah, Shenzhen is like, it's a city in southern China. It's like across the Pearl River Delta from Hong Kong. You know, it's a typical Chinese story. It's this little city of only 13 million people that only. most people have never heard of. <laughs> yeah, I know, right? <laughs> Bigger than New York, more people living in Shenzhen than New York City. Uh, but, you know, they've they, all their electric logistics vehicles at this point are, they're almost all electric. All their buses are electric. So they have these massive charging depots. I think the biggest charging station in the world is there. Wow. And, you know, that's what we're going to be seeing. But you know, we're going to have to fix some of the problems we've got. <laughs> yeah, they can't have half those chargers not working. Like, oh, that's not, no. not going to fly. No. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so uh, our last guest today has actually tackled this problem head on. And she's doing it in an incredibly uh, inspirational way. Her name is Camille Terry. And she is the CEO and co-founder of Charger Help. Yeah. You know, this whole thing about chargers not working, Camille sees this problem as a big opportunity, not just to keep these chargers up and running, but to create a new type of profession, good paying jobs for people who actually live in these communities. So let's hear from Camille. We're definitely in the midst of seeing charging stations deployed all throughout the world in the United States. I'm sure Sure. Well, people always talk about it's like the chicken before the egg. I feel like I've been hearing that for the last like five years while I've been in this industry. Um, but at least within California specifically, right, our governor has committed to only do new car sales. So I think that EVs are coming. I think at this point, it's like how affordable is it to put in that infrastructure? Um, and then also people being excited about the technology. Uh, the one thing I'll add there is like, Teslas are cool because, like, they look like the future, right? With some of the charging stations these days, they don't necessarily look like the future. Some of them actually just look like gas stations. And it's like, if you want consumers <laughs> to be excited, you have to build the future. <laughs> That's right, totally. And so, so when it comes to these charging stations, obviously, like you mentioned Tesla. So, like, if you're a Tesla owner, you have the supercharging network. It's kind of like baked in for you, which I think was really smart on Tesla's part. But if you're not a Tesla owner, what is right. life like finding a charging station, especially in L.A.? Like, I know there's like 16 different apps and maybe you have to have a bunch of different cards. Explain it, though. <laughs> yeah, I think that it's a little tragic today for when you look to find a charging station. Because number one, you have to find one. And number two... You have to hopefully that it works or that yep. it's in an area that will allow you to sit there in a safe, you know, way. Um, I think there's just a lot of opportunity um, in order for us to, to um, yeah, to have a better experience for people who don't drive Teslas, right? Yeah, I, I know exactly what you're talking about. I actually drive a Chevy Volt which is that hybrid, it's plug-in hybrid, right? I can plug it in, but at the same time, I can run on gas and limited places to charge. But the biggest mm -hmm. issue that I run into is whether it's Blink or whether it's ChargePoint, which I have like a card for, <clears throat> half the time when I pull up to those chargers, they don't work. Mm -hmm. so, so what's going on there with charging station <laughs> functionality? Yes. <laughs> I take a pause and like, I know. 
Um, well, so that's really, you know, one of the reasons why I decided to start Charger Hope. I used to work mm-hmm. for a network provider and just realized as a network provider, we were, you know, very consumed with the software. We absolutely wanted our stations to be online. But when you started dispersing fuel, you have charging stations literally everywhere. In L.A., we have charging stations on lampposts, right? And so when those stations are going <laughs> down and they're not, like, communicating to you anymore, it is a challenge to find someone that can get on site very quickly, that not just understands the electrical issues, but like actually understands like the software issues and the firmware issues and communication and the driver experience and if the app is working. And that's just literally a whole new set of, of workers. And thank goodness, you know, there's charger help now. Um, and that's what we're solving for. We're saying, hey, there's a certain type of skill set that is required in order to keep this new infrastructure online, right? And that it has to be local workers because you never go to a gas station and gas doesn't come out. It's weird. (laughs) It would be weird. I would think, everybody would think it would be weird. So there's no way you should drive up to a charging station and electricity doesn't come out. Uh, But at gas stations, you have attendants. You have somebody that's there literally all of the time. You know, and so like not thinking towards the future, how do we solve for that? You know, when you disperse the the, the um, infrastructure, and we definitely see that charger help. You know, is, is that solution? Yeah, this is great because you said what I was going to say is when I go to the gas station, the pump <laughs> always works, right? The other thing is the pump is really simple technology. It's a pump. Like all I have to do is take that nozzle out, stick it in the car, I pull the trigger, boom, I got gas, right? But it, but when I'm dealing with these EV chargers, it's software. And mm-hmm. that adds another layer of complexity. So obviously, you know, we have to make these solutions work for everybody. For this, right. for this energy transition to electrify transportation, we need to make a solution that really easily, seamlessly works. And frankly, when I go home, I just plug into the side of the building and it works too. Uh, mm. so how do we deal with this complexity of the fact that, you know, that we need software to make these public chargers work? I definitely think that there has to be a little bit more regulation for whether it's the government or whatever have you, but just on, um, on the uptime of the charging stations, like today, really like who gets in trouble if their charging stations are consistently not working, who even knows <laughs> if their charging stations aren't consistently working, right? And like, who is who is measuring that? And I think that when you have a, you know, they might be an unpopular opinion, but kind of like an unregulated system, you're going to get what you're going to get because no one is holding anyone accountable, right? And, and you see, to to, to today, um, there's going to be so much more money being poured into to this industry, and with that, you're going to get more people that think that it's easy to, to run a network, which is not. It's not easy. Anybody out there thinking about starting an EV charging station network, realize it's not easy. Um, but we definitely need more people calling folks out um, and making sure that the stuff that they put in the ground works. Period. Exactly. <laughs> so, I mean, yeah, this is it. It seems fundamental and basic, but and I think that's why it's sort of a conundrum for people. Why does why don't these things work when I expect them to work? So uh, this is a very basic question, and I would love to hear your mm-hmm. your response. It's like, why don't we see these these chargers being maintained, whether it's at a restaurant or at a parking garage or what have you? Like, what's broken in this process here? Honestly, I, I two things stick out to me. I think the the first thing, which I don't know how you saw for it, but it's like most of the infrastructure is subsidized, right? Most people, right, got these charging stations for free. And sometimes when you get things for free, you know, you're, you're you have less skin in the game, right? And then you have folks that like they themselves don't drive EV chargers, and then they're sold on this idea that it's going to drive business, but maybe that's not immediately happening. And therefore, their, like, commitment to the station's uptime, you know, isn't there because that value really isn't being seen by them. And it was free. Um, And I think the other part to it, which is starting to change a little bit, is that a lot of the utility contracts were paying network providers software fees all up front. So you got a 10-year contract and you were paid 
all of that money up front. And so there was no incentive for you to keep your software running because it didn't matter because there's no penalties. There's no regulations because you already got paid for it. <laughs> and now we're seeing Southern California Edison's their new charge ready program. Now that now they actually pay month by month and, and they're redefining what is network uptime. You know, previously network uptime was like, is your AWS system working? Not is this charging station maybe sending what they call like a heartbeat, but it's still not, you know, just, you know, <laughs> dispensing any energy. Mm-hmm. Right. And so people were able to claim like, oh, we had 99.9% uptime. And you're like, but uptime of what? Like that broken charging station down the street? Like, I don't think so. <laughs> so I think that <laughs> you're starting to see, a, it's the market is maturing. I think at the end of the day, it's like the market is maturing. I don't think that anybody is moving in a way that is, um, I guess, like intentionally negligible. Mm-hmm. However, I do think we have to mature a lot faster as more money enter into this market. You know, and a lot of folks have been around for for longer, like your charge points of the world. You know, they they, they have to step up and be like, okay, well, how am I going to set a standard um, around maintenance and service level agreements and all of that jazz? And these people aren't in the business of maintaining chargers. They're in the business of selling retail products or (laughs) selling food or, you know, booking people in hotels, right? It's not their (laughs) expertise at all. Right. And I don't think they should. I honestly, at least specifically in California, I don't know if it should be their responsibility. Like, in my mind, I feel like it should be the responsibility of the network, right? Like, I'd be interested to see, like, who cleans, like, the Amazon, like, lockers or whatever. Like, these companies that have these things about, like, usually that person that you're renting out that space to isn't necessarily the one responsible. So, I think that, yeah, I think that it should rely on the network providers. And we have, like, for, with Charger Help, right, like, we have contracts you know, with a lot of these larger network providers that now we are the ones that are going to be maintaining the stations, right? Like we're deploying 20 technicians in seven states at the end of April um, to start us some national contracts. So, you know, we're coming. We're, we're, we're almost there. <laughs> I'm going to have all my techs have little cakes. Like, don't worry, team. We're here to save the day. <laughs> Would you say that was sort of the main um one of the main drivers for you to start Charger Help, or was there were there other aspects of what you learned in your previous, uh, you know, your previous experiences that that brought you to this place? Yeah, I think that that was definitely a core driver. But my main dro- driver is job creation. Like our industry talks about green jobs all the time, and all I was like, "What's well, tell me? Tell me more about." <laughs> where all of these thousands of jobs, what is this job title? What is this work you're going to be doing? And most importantly, are these green jobs all engineers? Is it going to actually support what we like to call the regular, regular people <laughs> that live across the America, you know, America, right? And, and you know, are we going to require, I, I serve as a, a, on the workforce development um, chair for the climate reality project. And I, I started that, that position because we kept talking about how we're going to shut down all these oil places here in LA. And I was like, so like, you know, people who work there, like they just try to like pay a bill. And y'all over here just trying to like disqualify their old job. Like, what is, that's not the best way to go about this. And you're not even giving them a tangible way to have another job. You're just like, sorry, the company that you worked for is doing this bad thing. Therefore, you don't deserve a job. And I'm not going to help you place you somewhere else. That's wild. That's weird. It's not okay. And so I think like that was the driver with Charger Help. It's like, okay, how can I solve a real problem? How can I utilize technology to do that? How can I make sure that people are paid equitably? And, And how do you get more people actually involved, you know, in this EV revolution, just regular regular people that live throughout the U.S. in rural areas, urban areas, wherever have you, right? Like, how do you do that with technology? And I think that's the thing I'm most excited about with what we feel at Charger Health. Yeah, I mean, so would you call yourselves like the Uber of uh, charging stations? Sort of like you, do, you can sort Not- of use technology to sort of bring, contact people wherever they are locally and go fix the charger? 
Yeah, I guess to a certain extent, the, diff- the, the biggest difference with us is that all of our technicians are employees, so we don't do anything <laughs> like that. Um, oh, okay, got and you. And so, yeah, and so we, and then the other really cool part is that our technicians make between 30 and $39 an hour, and that's based on the middle class income of that community. And so, and these people... The extra service techs from like ga- oil and gas folks. We have like people that work with Comcast, but just quality people that are very fired up of understanding what, you know, environmental justice and all of this stuff means that they never had been exposed to it before. But because I'm offering them a job, now I'm making them an equal part, you know, of, of what we're trying to do as, as an industry. So do you see this as a path for empowerment of a wider demographic than is than we often see in the clean energy industry? Which, I mean, I look at the solar industry, which I worked in for years. It's very white. Well, very no, absolutely. And one of yeah, and one of my biggest critiques, even with solar too, is like you know you have spaces that were hiring and training black and brown folks, but they left them on the roofs. They never became mm-hmm. project managers or engineers. They were always mm-hmm. the one that's installing. You know what I mean? And they weren't even getting paid that much. And so for us, people are always like, well, what company do you like want to be like? And I'm like, oh, well, we look really at all the companies we don't want to be like. That's how we <laughs> end <this> up here. <laughs> but for us, we, we're seeing it as like, yeah, as a certain way that you can model your business. Like we're going to be, we're very, you know, moving on our way to profitability. We'll probably be profitable by the end of this year, right? We have great margins and we're a venture backed company and we pay technicians really well and we have great service and we have cool technology, like crazy. You can like do all of these things to be a successful company. You know, you don't have to take advantage of people. So we hope that people will see us as a model. You know, and how how you how you have to do business moving forward. You know, Camille is just she's so inspiring. I mean, here she is taking on one of the big challenges of electrifying transportation and doing it in a way. I just feel like this is someone who just sees potential in problems and. Yeah, I think she's got an incredible vision Mm -hmm. for the future. Yeah, I love how she's really focusing on fixing a really big problem and doing it with a focus on diversity. You know, I can think of plenty of other types of people who might have seen the same problem, but assumed it was a gig economy type of business model. And it doesn't have to be. No, I mean, you can make good jobs. You know, and I think this is a great example of where there is destruction, there is creation. We hear a lot of sometimes, we hear a lot of concerns about people working in the fossil fuel industries. Some of these are more in the case of coal workers, which they're already going out of business. It may be a little bit more hyped. Mm -hmm. But, you know, when we move to these new energy technologies, there's a new need for skilled labor. Right. And, and I think that this speaks to what the energy transition can be, which is not just an opportunity to build something better, not just better cars, but better jobs. Mm-hmm. Because who would not want to be a charging station technician instead of a gas station attendant? Absolutely. And watching this transition is really exciting. We've got new business models. So I can't wait to really see what the charging station of the future is going to evolve into. I can sense like you have your little coffee bar and maybe there's some nap pods and... (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> right. Um, uh, depending on how fast this charging becomes, I have read some early uh, reports that we might get down to as fast as 10 minutes to charge your vehicle fully or maybe up to 80 percent. Right. So there's a lot of potential here beyond just the concept of driving an electric vehicle. Yeah. The transition to EVs is not just about changing the kind of car you drive. And as suggested by Charles, I think this future is going to be here a lot faster than what the mainstream analysts predict. Mm -hmm. Well, just like we explored in our first episode, the future of energy, or also known as energy predictions, are hard. It's difficult Mm -hmm. to predict this stuff, right? And if you haven't heard that episode, go and listen to it. Shameless plug. Sorry, couldn't resist. Yeah, I mean, that's a theme that seems to keep coming up in our podcast so far. The future is closer than you think. Mm -hmm. Uh, Unless we're talking about new nuclear designs when the future is perpetually 20 years away. Oh my gosh. That is, (laughs) sorry, that's my shameless plug for our nuclear episode. Um, (laughs) It's good. We got to do it, right? It's important. Uh, But I'm with Charles. The energy transition is going to be here faster than we expect. 
And especially for those who aren't paying attention, right? And people are just going to be blindsided. However, for those of us that are paying attention, we can prepare and we can make better decisions based on this information and take advantage of this, not just for ourselves, but for our communities so that we can have a more beneficial future for us collectively on this planet. And, you know, this brings up something else. We've, we've talked a lot about car, you know, having cars, driving cars. We're going to have more to say about transportation in future episodes. Absolutely. And spoiler alert, it's not going to be all about cars mm-hmm. because personally, I don't see the future of transportation being about owning a large metal box mm-hmm. entirely. There's going to be, there's a lot of other things going on here. E-bikes, but, scooters. Oh yeah, micromobility, that space is fascinating. We're going to have more to say about that, but for now, thank you for joining us in our exploration of this emergent future. And until next time, I'm one of your hosts, Christian Roseland. And I'm Lisa Ann Pinkerton, here to say that the quality of your timeline depends on the decisions you make, so make them count, Earthlings. <laughs>